Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. I'm Dr. Catherine Rossi. I'm the interim dean of the College of Humanities and Sciences. And I was delighted when uh, Jason Arnold, the chair of political science, invited me just to say some opening remarks, which are going to be brief before this wonderful panel on foreign affairs and working at the State Department. I just had the pleasure of meeting Miles Gordon, who is VCU's Senior Director of Government and Community. And the first thing he said is, I wish there had been a committee on sub-government when I was in college, right? And that just shows you how important and how valuable this experience is for you students who are here and for those of you who are Zooming. And I can't thank Jason and Bill and our panelists enough for bringing this to students and may giving them the opportunity to have a roundtable discussion and actually engage with practitioners in the field and learn exactly what's going on and what the opportunities would be for them moving forward in professional careers. So I welcome our speakers. I'm going to let Bill Newman give the actual introductions, but I'm just delighted to hear the conversation for what I can stay of. And but more importantly, I'm delighted the opportunity to have everyone here and to have you have exposure to these wonderful practitioners. So without that further ado, because time is precious, I'm going to pitch it to Bill. Thank you. Uh, I was also thank uh, Jason for setting all this up. And I'm Bill Newman. I'm in the Florida Science Department. And I went and looked up everybody's bio and then got here and said, do you want me to do that? Like, nah, not really. So what I'll do is just introduce everyone and then they'll tell you a, a little bit about uh, how they got to where they are today. Because I think that might be the most interesting thing for students is the, the pathway to get to uh, impressive careers like this. So without a, a much else, uh, just to introduce everybody, we've got uh, Danny Rochetti, uh, State Department Director of Intergovernmental Affairs and Ambassador Nina Shigian, who is the Special Representative for Subnational Diplomacy. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Newman. Thank you, Dean. It's wonderful to be here on the VCU campus. My first time in Richmond, actually, and the first time to this campus. Lovely building you have here. And uh, great to see all of you this morning. Um, and thanks for setting this up. So uh, I have a, what I'm doing now is I'm the Special Representative for Subnational Diplomacy. Danny is my deputy. Um, and I can tell you about what that means and uh, what we're trying to do. It's a brand new part of the State Department. But I first thought I would tell you a little bit about my very strange path to getting to where I am now. So I was a, um, I got a biology degree undergraduate. I was a BS. I applied to two different jobs out of college. One was to be a photojournalist and the other one was to go to Capitol Hill and I didn't get the photojournalism internship. Uh, so I went to Capitol Hill, and then I worked, I worked for our representative for the area where I'd gone to college. Um, that was the time, ancient history now, but when there was um, the, uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre, and, uh, and I remember speaking to the Lincoln Memorial, like, oh, we have the Congressman couldn't do it or something. All these students who were uh, wanted to stay in the United States because they were worried to go back to China. Um, and that may have been, I was always interested in foreign policy and studied it a little bit in, in college, but that's, I think, what crystallized my interest. Um, anyway, I then decided to go to law school because I noticed that everyone around me, or I liked the way they thought and they had all gotten law degrees. What I didn't realize is like none of them were lawyers. <laughs> so <laughs> law school was very much like a, it's very much a trade school. It's like if you, you know, you go to plumbing school to be a plumber, you go to law school to be a lawyer, they teach you how to be a lawyer, uh, which is, turns out not what I wanted to do. Um, but I, you know, I worked for a law firm briefly and then moved to DC um, and eventually got myself to really bad luck um, to be uh, a special assistant in the White House for the National Security Advisor and the Deputy National Security Advisor back in the Clinton days and occupied a tiny little closet uh, with one other person um, and saw all of how foreign policy is made um, because that's what that part of the White House does. It kind of coordinates it among all the other agencies. And it was fantastic, scary. It became, it was scary and then it was mundane, but when I look back on it, it was fantastic. Um, so then um, moved back to Los Angeles where um, my husband is from and where I got married. Then there were, I worked in think tanks after that for RAND and then for the Center for American Progress. Um, 
um, wrote a book, co wrote a book, um, and um, and then worked on worked on always worked on campaigns as sort of a foreign policy advisor um, for a long time. I've done that, and I recommend that also as something to think about doing. Um, and then uh, got a chance to become an ambassador, and so I was an ambassador out in Jakarta, Indonesia, for about two and a half years under President Obama, which was wonderful. Um, and so ASEAN are these ten Southeast Asian countries that have an association to try to keep the peace amongst them. It's actually done a really good job of that. Um, so you know, Indonesia, Thailand, and Philippines. Vietnam, Singapore. Um, then uh, I was kicked out <laughs> by the new administration, the Trump administration, and went back to Los Angeles and um, started talking to the mayor's office. And finally, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, which was to be the first deputy mayor for international affairs. So I did that for five years in Los Angeles and loved it. Uh, it was um, much more concrete, in, well, not, not entirely, but it was much more immediately visible, um, my work uh, in the life of the city, and that was really exciting. So um, we, did, we did, you know, everything from uh, starting a new program to send community college students on their first trips overseas, often first trips on airplanes, to um, attracting foreign investment to the city, uh, hosting, we got to host a summit uh, just this year in June, the Summit of the Americas. Um, we signed agreements with uh, cities and countries to, to exchange technical information on how to save how to save water, for example, um, and uh, you know many other kinds of. We were very active on the in the climate um, international mayors group which is called C40, and, I, and the mayor that I worked for chaired that. So we did a lot of climate um, work in the city as well as climate advocacy um, around the world. Uh, and then I uh, was lucky enough to be appointed to this job by, um, by our Secretary of State. And what this job is, is um, working with cities and states um, on international engagements. Um, so subnational simply means like entities that exist within governments, and that can be a county, it can be a town, it can be a city, a territory, or a province, depending on what country you're in. And so I see our work as sort of three, three in three areas. So one is to bring the benefits of foreign policy to the local level. So that can be an investment, that can be an opportunity for students. Um, the second is to help and encourage our cities and states to do more on the international stage, because uh, a lot of the rest of the world is more active than we are, strangely. Um, and then third is to help the State Department think in terms of subnational actors. We, they, you know, the State Department is very much about country to country relations, bilateral relations, or groups of countries, multilateral relations, but they, it hasn't yet regularly or routinely or in any kind of organized way engaged at the local level. And sometimes that's very helpful, because if you, you know, are getting resistance from a national government about, you know, sustainable infrastructure or something, there could very well be a mayor or a governor who wants to actually do that. And, you know, if we're going to uh, fight climate change, we're going to need everybody to, to engage. So that's um, a little about me. I would, you know, generally encourage you to think about a career in diplomacy and in, in the State Department. Uh, we hire not just political scientists, but also um, engineers and computer um, computer science majors and doctors and all kinds of others. And uh, the folks that I worked with when I was in uh, our the embassy in Jakarta were amazing, and um, you know, traveled around with their families, like you know, to all kinds of cool places. And there's sort of two tracks: there's a foreign service track, and there's a civil service track, and they're both interesting and good in different ways. Um, 
I'll just leave it at that and turn it over to Nick. Great. Well, it's, like I said, as uh, Ambassador Jean said, it's lovely to be here on, on campus. Um, I'm Danny. Uh, I'm the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs uh, at the State Department. We'll soon become Ambassador um, Jean's deputy. Um, I'll be very brief, um, just because I know we want to get into a conversation here. Uh, how I came to where I am at right now. Um, I'm a William & Mary grad, so please don't hold that against me. Um, and after uh, graduating uh, from there, I worked on uh, Terry McCall's campaign in 2013. I was running the first, first uh, actually the second time running for governor, but first in the general. Um, and then through that, I was able to get an opportunity just by um, networking to go get a staff assistant job up on the Foreign Relations Committee in the United States Senate. So answering the mail, answering the phones, um, doing all the backroom work and just making sure the committee functions. And uh, while going to Georgetown for night school and security, just worked my way up over a number of years. Um, my background mostly is in nuclear weapons policy and cyber issues. Um, and then when the Biden administration came in in 2021, I was very fortunate enough to be offered a position at the department. I was first working for the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. I was that individual senior advisor. And then after a year, I moved over to the, be the director of intergovernmental affairs. Um, and at that time, I also learned that Ambassador Jian would soon be coming in. And uh, when that occurred, I was very pleased to know that I'd be coming over and working with her on subnational diplomacy. And I know for us, engagements like this with, with youth and students who are the future leaders of cities, states, countries potentially, um, I know it's not just great for you to hear from us, but I know we also want to hear from you uh, about some of the issues that you see the country facing, the cities facing. We'd love to hear your innovative ideas on how to solve some of those challenges as well. But uh, instead of me pontificating, I would love to turn it back over to you and back to the ambassador. So. Yeah, I think we can just open it up for any comments or questions. Um, the last thing I actually mm -hmm. want to say before doing that though is that um, the State Department is really focused on bringing a diverse group of folks to uh, to work in our diplomatic corps and in the civil service. Um, you know, traditionally, like many institutions, it's um, it hasn't been as reflective of the diversity of the United States, but it is very determined to change that. And so, just wanted to make that point too, so that um, you know everyone is welcome. Yes, we want to open up to questions for, for you to find out what you want to know. So uh, It can be anything. Yeah. So Absolutely. Anything. And don't be shy. Yeah, no dumb questions. And my role is moderating. Yeah, apparently, if point. nobody's going to ask a question, I'll jump in. I think we have one more. <laughs> I was going to ask, oh, I was going to ask, I was going to ask, I was but you can just call me Nina, that's fine. Okay. Um, I was wondering, uh, did your like, focus on climate change from your biodegree of the No, it did not. Uh, it came from, well, I mean, it came from just you know, reading the papers, but it also came from, I think, especially this the five years that I worked in the city, because LA, strange, I mean, LA, you would not think of it as a leader in climate change, but it really is. Like, we are 60% renewable energy on the grid, largest number of electric cars anywhere, largest number of chargers anywhere, like really trying to do all the things um, and have very ambitious goals to be net zero on our grid by 2035. Um, so, uh, and then trying to change the building codes as well. Actually in LA, buildings are a huge carbon emitter um, in addition to cars. So, um, so yeah, I think it came from that. And, um, and from seeing that it can be done you know, that was the coolest part about working in a city and working in cities in general uh, is that you can actually move the needle, you know, in real time almost. You know, if you, if you lay out a plan, if you've got great, you know, people thinking about it with you, you can, you can really change a place and, uh, you know, in, in, in the manner of 10 years, you know, which is not that much time when you, you know, in, in government terms. <laughs> Um, I guess my question would be, how much of your career do you think was like you specifically planning ahead to do things and like sort of envisioning exactly what you were going to do, and how often do you just like pick 
pick up opportunities they come across. We might answer this differently. <laughs> I have never had a plan. Uh, I have had like vague ideas, you know, like maybe one day I'll would like to be an ambassador, like that kind of thing, but never a plan. So, I mean, if I'd gotten a photojournalism internship after college, like, who knows where I would be. Like, I just, you know, did the kind of next thing that seemed most captivating to me at the time, most interesting. I just tried to follow what I was, what, you know, where I got excited about something. Um, so, yeah, no plan. I, I, you know, I admire people who have plans. I just am not that person. Like, even throughout my time at, in, in the White House, I did have a vague notion that, you know, because I was going to live in L.A., right? And L.A. does not have a State Department. So trying to figure out, like, how am I going to do this? Um, and it ended up I worked for RAND, the think tank, and I headed up an Asia center there. But what my plan was, or my thinking was, was I would um, write a law review article, and then I would become a law professor. But then when I sat down to write, I wrote a foreign affairs article. And so I was like, all right, well, <laughs> I'll try to get this published. And then I got it published, you know, at the time in a journal that where it mattered. These days there's so many places, but um, that it like that it was almost a calling card at that point that I know something about foreign affairs. So that's how it went down. But you should answer because you might have a different Well, as someone who has cited some of your papers and some of my college papers. <laughs> Definitely tell you before you use it. Oh yes, seriously. <laughs> you have a foreign affairs article on China yeah, that I used that's back really in funny. graduate that's school. That's the article I was talking about. Yep, yep. Um, I, I actually agree with a lot of what uh, Ambassador Gene. So I did have a plan coming out of college. I grew up in Arlington, Virginia. I knew I wanted to work in Washington D.C. Um, so that's why I decided to go work on the campaign, and then got lucky enough to have an opportunity on the Hill. Um, but that's kind of where the plan ended. If someone had told me 10 years ago I'd be working on subnational diplomacy, I probably would have asked, what the heck is subnational diplomacy? Um, I, I think it's great to have plans, but um, I think it's also sometimes unique opportunities pop up in unique ways. Um, a year ago, I was not the director of intergovernmental affairs. I'd never really done what we call IGA work in any way, shape, or form. And, um, someone just offered this opportunity, I took it, and a lot of it was just learning how to do the job. And um, now I think I've got a decent scope on it, and now I can use it to help the ambassador here. So I did have a plan, but it went off in a weird direction. I will say this just reminds me of one like general career piece of advice that I would give you, um, especially to the women in the audience, um, is you kind of have to take risks. Every time, let me put it this way, Every time I've taken a risk uh, and gotten a job where I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing, like, I don't know if this is going to work out, is when I had the best experiences. So um, I really encourage that. It's going to feel, you know, for the first bit in any job, like you have no idea what you're doing. Um, and then uh, that's okay, though. That means you're being stretched. And you're being, you know, you're learning things. You're picking up skills. So I'd recommend that as generic. running a part of a think tank uh, when I was working at RAND, actually when I was working for the San Franco Partners also, but the business of think tanks is basically research and writing and advocacy, depending on the think tank. So you are, you know, trying to come up with ideas that will help policymakers or influence the public or um, influence a debate in Congress, depending on, you know, what you're doing. Um, RAND had a lot of government clients. So um, some of the studies there were like very specific, like nuts and bolts logistics things for like the army, and then there were other things that were about healthcare and um, about you know gun violence and like a huge range of different things that Rand did. Um, but the, at the end of the day, it was a report, you know, that would then be put on the website and people could download it. And 
that's and, and they've done some incredible groundbreaking research that has influenced the, you know policies but at, at quite a distance right so they've done they did a lot of work on early childhood education and how investments in early childhood education are kind of one of the best things you can do you know that, like everything goes well when the first you know little bit of time that a human exists goes well um, so uh, that's so, and then Center for Progress is more advocacy oriented, more had a point of view, progressive point of view in this case, but there's also conservative think tanks with a conservative point of view. And then there, there they wanted to come up with ideas that would um, advance you know, foreign policy, but also advance domestic policy. In the government, you're doing it. So you, you often don't have time to have the big ideas. You have to either come in with big ideas or get the big ideas from the outside. Um, but you're then executing, you know, and it's a very different uh, kind of, um, you know, work. It's, it's making it happen in the real world. Um, and, you know, I remember the hardest question I was ever asked in an interview was I was interviewing to be the special assistant to the deputy national security advisor, and he's like, do you like to think or do you like to do? And I was like, oh, like, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, but uh, that, that is the truth, I like to do both, but as I get older, I like to do more than I like to think. Like, I like to come up with ideas, and I like to come to practice right away. Uh, that also comes from working in the city, I think. I'm like less patient now, like, I want to just get things done and have them affect the world in a good way. Okay. I, was wondering, <clears throat> sorry. I was wondering if you could describe the different experiences you might get from a service track versus a service track? Yeah, I'm going to turn that to Sure. So both, um, both offer kind of unique experiences, right? And there are, I would say, I, I, would, I would say, for example, when you take the foreign service track, um, obviously you have to test into it. Um, and uh, if you're accepted, um, you're going to be traveling all over the world, right? You'll be doing post two, three, you know, for two, three years. Um, a lot of it is uh, very uh, generalist, I think I would say. You know, when you're a foreign service officer, um, you know, you're bouncing. One year you may be in Jakarta, and then another you may be at the main state building in DC, and then the next one you're in Lima, Peru, which is a very kind of interesting uh, lifestyle. It's a way to uh, garner a really interesting skill set because. You may be doing Western Hemisphere issues one day, and then the next day, maybe doing cyber issues as well. Um, on, on the civil service side, I know um, from my previous job at the State Department, we had some really fantastic civil servants who really dive deeply into a lot of the issues that um, are uh, key challenges that the State Department faces. So when I did arms control, um, you know, I only know a certain set of arms control issues, but we were fortunate enough to have a lot of civil servants in our arms control bureaus who are experts on, maybe it's a treaty that I may not know very much about, or the physics behind missile systems or something like that. So a lot of the civil servants, while well, you can also have similar experiences in the foreign service, um, a lot of our civil servants also dive very deeply into key issues as well. And these are people that can um, spend 10, 15 years working on a very specific set of issues um, that, uh, you know, becomes really important uh, institutional knowledge for, for the department uh, moving forward. So I think that's maybe one of the key differences that you will find between foreign service and civil service officers. I will admit I am neither, so I don't have that much experience with it. I can only tell you what I've learned from osmosis, working with some of my fantastic colleagues who are both foreign service officers and civil service officers. Um, I would note, I think, just to put a cap on it, um, it doesn't matter which one, uh, whether you choose the Foreign Service route or the Civil Service route, they are both extremely fulfilling career paths. And um, as I'm sure Ambassador Chigin would also agree, it is what you take out of it as well. I mean, if you are really interested in traveling the world and uh, meeting interesting people and doing interesting work, Maybe the foreign service is for you. If you want to dive more into an issue, maybe the civil services. But regardless of whichever path you would consider, um, I don't think you would be disappointed. Why don't we ask the 
the other ambassador in the yeah, room. That's, that's great. That yeah. as well. So I'm um, Anthony Godfrey, and uh, I'm in the process of retiring from a 28-year career with the Department of State. I recently served as the U.S. Ambassador in Serbia, and I'm a Foreign Service Officer. I took the test. I made my way up the ranks. I'm not a political appointee. I worked for Republican and Democratic presidents, uh, and uh, it was a fantastic career. I'll, we could be around in uh, Richmond and your professor is going to be glad to meet you. But uh, uh, Dan's time is exactly right. Civil servants are uh, policy experts. They, they are the institutional memory. They don't move around, generally speaking. Foreign service officers have to pick up a new set of issues and uh, implement policy, influence foreign governments, try and advance America's interests and values overseas. Really important. And nowadays, that means using a whole bunch of tools that we can use to have, and it includes social media, and uh, direct engagement, and a million different other ways uh, of engaging. It's lots of fun. But uh, if you like a uh, constantly changing environment, and if you uh, have to think on your feet, then maybe the Foreign Service is the place to go. Uh, I certainly recommend it. Actually, did just um, maybe by coincidence, but you know, I worked um, during law school at the OECD, which is a organization based in Paris, which wasn't so bad. Um, that uh, does studies economics, and the United States is a member of it. So um, I studied uh, there and met with a guy, I met a guy during that time. Um, who was the chief antitrust officer of the Federal Trade Commission. And so once I had been, once I had worked in a law firm for about a year and decided it was definitely not what I wanted to do, um, I talked to that guy about opportunities in Washington at the Federal Trade Commission. So I then ended up at the Federal Trade Commission as an attorney advisor on antitrust and consumer protection issues to the chairman. Like, again, a job where I was like, oh, well, you know, I'll figure it out. Um, and then that's when it, and then made it over to the White House after that. So it did, practical, in practical terms, have that function. And I think it could, there are many people who go from a law degree to doing, you know, international policy, but there are plenty of people with an IR degree, a master's in international relations, that go into international law. So I think it's useful to have some kind of graduate degree at some point. I don't think you need to go there directly from college. It's good to have some work experience, I would, I would say. Um, 
but uh, it gives you, you know, network, and it also, um, you know, just gives you the additional, you know, thinking, you know, to, um, you know, that'll help you in your career. But plenty of people don't. Like plenty of people do, just, you know, go directly into service and then just stay there and, you know, work their way up. Yeah. Other questions? For instance, I don't have an advanced degree. There you go. Um, I was wondering if you could discuss uh, a little bit about possible internships at the State Department. For yeah, there are a bunch. There are, there's, um, and Danny can add more to this, but there's um, virtual internships, there's summer internships, um, there are programs, um, the Wrangell and Pickering Fellowships that will help pay for college and then uh, for, 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 um, for historically you know, discriminated against groups and also the folks who can't afford it. Uh, and, then, and then put you into, like you're kind of first in line or whatever to go into the Foreign Service after that. Um, what am I forgetting? There's, I mean, there's also the Foreign Affairs IT Fellowship as well. There are a number of other paid internships as well. Um, a lot of this you can find on state.gov or career at careers.state.gov as well. But the first thing I would do is also just troll the website first. And I would also look into the Pickering and the Wrangell uh, fellowships as well, which are two of the more well-known uh, programs uh, that you can potentially apply to um, and join if accepted that provide those opportunities at the same time. Questions, all these mm -hmm. questions. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think in my case, for this job, there aren't too many people who have both local and federal experience. Like, I both had been at the State Department and had worked for a mayor. So there aren't, I can't think of another person actually. <laughs> there might, I'm sure there are some, but I can't think of them right now. Like they. I've never met another person who's, who has that weird combination of, of, um, of experiences. So I would say that's part of it. Part of it is, like, I've known these people for, these people meaning the leaders now, for like 20 years. So they also know who I am, they know that I don't have two heads, you know, I'm like, whatever, I, I can perform, you know. So that's part of it too. And I would say honestly, like for political appointees, which we are, which means um, we are appointed, you know, through the White House, and there are certain. So for, for ambassadors, there's about thirty percent. Is that right? Thirty percent political. It changes. Right. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think it's still whatever. Thirty thirty five percent um, of of all the ambassadorships are political appointees, and the rest are all career. And so for those, um, you know, if it's somebody who both has relevant experience and knows the president. You know, that's helpful. I didn't know the president, but, um, uh, and I didn't know the President Obama either, but I knew some of his folks, and so if you're picking from a big, you know, pool of, of candidates, all of whom are qualified, you know, you'll tend to go with the ones that you know, the ones who believed in you early on, you know, all that stuff. Is that accurate? You yeah, no, I, I agree completely. Your... So, um, like I said previously, I had a background in armed control and nuclear weapons, and that is, you know, fortunately, they had a position open in that undersecretaryship. So I was of a group of people selected for that. Um, I also, um, you know, I think one of the ways if you're interested in getting in politics is, um, and I'll try to stay as apolitical as possible, there's obviously working on campaigns as well. So um, I also worked on the Biden campaign. I volunteered there. I was out in Iowa, um, which was not so fun, but, um, Part of if you're trying to make your way into Washington D.C. politics is um, obviously it's kind of luck of the draw when it comes to who wins and who loses as well. Right, um, but I think Ambassador Chiang is being a little bit too modest there. Uh, uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan and Secretary Blinken, before they were in those positions, while it was still the early stages of the, of the campaign, had decided that part of uh, the policy would be to connect 
the benefits of foreign policy with voters and individuals and organizations in the United States. So with that policy decision, with that policy thrust, they had to find somebody who had experience both in uh, work in, in regions, subnational regions, and in foreign policy. And that's where, you know, uh, that's why she had the first name. We have time for one more question. About five, five minutes. Great. Cyber issues. Yes. Well, I can tell you, uh, I don't have the IT or technical experience. Um, I can tell you from my own from my own experience while I was working on the committee, um, I was in graduate school and studying, you know, cyber policy essentially, but I didn't have a huge knowledge base or interest in it. But I was then tasked by the committee to write the committee report on China and digital authoritarianism, and when you're boss tells you to do something, you do it. And I think over a number of years, um, as Ambassador Chigian said, when you go into a job, you may not necessarily know right off the bat what you're doing, but it's a great way to stretch your mind and learn more. So um, in this case, I wouldn't be too worried about having the IT or technical background. Obviously, it can be helpful. But um, in my case, I did not have it, and I was afforded and, and lucky enough to get the opportunity to learn while I was doing the job as well. Um, and then over time, I, I gained a knowledge base that I could then take on to my next job and can continue carrying on uh, moving forward. I think it's a great field to go into. Mm -hmm. And you can always you know, get, take an online course in, you know, uh, I think you need, to, you need to not be scared of the technical stuff, uh, at least. You might not know it, but you have to, I think, be able to converse with the people you know, mm -hmm. whose lives it is to, to know the technical stuff. Uh, so you want to get to at least that level of fluency, um, but it's but you don't have to be like a super expert yourself in the because the technical stuff changes all the time also, right? I mean we're going to all be doing quantum computing in a few years. Nobody even knows what that is now. Or what, I have a vague idea what it is now, but <laughs> not a, not a solid one. Um, so you know so I think so I you know I agree with Danny, but but you know getting yourself a little bit more up to speed by you know doing a lot of reading, taking yep. a course, or whatever is not. And those technical experts can be great sources of information as well. Mm -hmm. So as, as well to like smart yourself, you can say take a license. Yeah. yeah. It's just bad. Or just take a couple courses in school. I mean, if I can uh, jump in, there's kind of a, uh, a place where the people who work on uh, international security policy as it relates to cyber uh, overlaps with the people who work on implementing who are the actual but uh, they very often cross over, and uh, I think that there's a lot of room for people who are interested in working on the issue, uh, on the issue uh, who don't have that strong technical background, but who can uh, speak in policy terms and frankly can write very clearly, and uh, really these are things that are skills that you can bring uh, any conversation. The ambassador brings up a great point. If you know how to write, 